She said two Big Macs, two fish fillets. No, 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 no. She said two Big Mac. No, no, no. She said two Big Macs, two fish fillets. No, that's not it. I need a tinfoil hat. What do you think, Ellen? Hey Earthlings, welcome to Cloud Shadow TV. My name is Jessie. This is episode one of the Alien Abduction Support Group. I am your host. Here at the Alien Support Group, we talk about aliens. We are believers. We are gonna get into the thick of it. But today, we're talking about our first case, which is the disappearance of Frederick Fountage, who was an Australian fellow. He was a pilot in Australia. He was on a solo flight and he disappeared mysteriously his last words being, it's hovering and it's not an aircraft. And we're gonna get into what happened to him, the actual incident, who he was, and then some theories surrounding it. And you know, why I believe aliens were involved. If you wanna be a part of the Alien Abduction Support Group, please like and subscribe and keep watching this video. I hope you enjoy. Oh, and this is Alan, my alien. He's a, he's here for support, he's my, um, in-person supportee. He's been abducted by aliens too. It was a different type of aliens than his alien. Traumatizing though. He doesn't want to talk about it. So maybe another video. Sorry. Alan. He's telling me to shut up. He only speaks telepathically. So let's get straight to it. Frederick Valentich was born on June 9th, 1958. So he's a Gemini like me. <laughs> His parents were named Guido and Alberta Valentich, and Alberta actually didn't speak English. They were Italian immigrants, and Guido spoke good English, but I guess Alberta didn't, so she wasn't really interviewed in the report or seen in any interviews. So if you're wondering why is his mom never mentioned, um, I think that's why she didn't speak English, so they didn't really interview her. Maybe they did somewhere in Italy. I don't know if anybody knows. Let me know in the comments. and. Uh, this is my first YouTube video, so like and subscribe if you like it. It would definitely help motivate more videos like this. And we need community members in the alien abduction support group. So, anyways, back to Fred. He was the oldest of four children. He, at the time when this happened, which was in 1978, he had a 12-year-old brother and two twin sisters who were three, Lara and Olivia. And I'm pretty sure that they primarily spoke Italian as well and they spoke Italian in the household. Although he did get a C in Italian in high school, which not to bring up his high school grades, like I don't care, but it is important to the story because I guess his intelligence and how good of a pilot he is became in question when he had this accident or disappearance. We're not exactly sure what happened. That will be up to you to decide what you think as you watch the video. He, he had a girlfriend who was named Rhonda Rushton. She was 17 years old and Fred was 20. So people give Fred a hard time a lot because like of the wrong things. I think this is the weirdest thing about Fred is that he had a 17 year old girlfriend and he was 20. Like three years is not a bad age difference when you're like 20 and 23. I don't know, maybe they were on more of the same life path time in 1978 in Australia. I don't know what the age rules are there, but little, a little suspicious Fred <laughs> um, but yeah I think people really give Fred a hard time about like the wrong things and I think overall Fred was like a really determined strong interesting person who definitely deserves like to be taken seriously so he also had a best friend whose name was Gregory and they met at the air training corps because Fred's dream was to be a pilot at first he wanted to be a part of the Royal Australian Air Force but he didn't get in um, and so his new goal was to become a commercial pilot and so he was in the process of trying to get his commercial pilot license although he was struggling a little bit to pass the test and that's something that we're going to talk about. Fred was from Avondale Heights which is like a suburb of Melbourne, Australia which I heard is called Melbourne to Australians but um, I'm American, so I'm going to say Melbourne because I feel funny saying Melbourne. Fred went to Keeler Heights High School, and he wasn't the best student. He had an A and PE, but other than that, he mostly got C's and D's, and he actually failed math. Like I said, I don't care about his 
grades, but it's sort of important to the story. He was said to be quiet until you got to know him, but he was thought of well by his friends and family. Fred was a shop assistant at an army disposal store. He lived with his parents and he was said to be um, like a good kid. He did the duties he was supposed to do around the house and he helped out with his little sister, which was also brought up by his mentor, who was a guy named Robert Barnes. I think he was a instructor or a teacher at the school where he went to to get his commercial pilot license. He would um, have one-on-one -on -one lessons with Fred at his home on Sundays and a lot of times Fred would bring his little sisters and um, Mr. Barnes was, he said that Fred took really good care of them and was always attentive to, attentive to them but he was also like doing his assignment and his work so um, he was a good brother. <laughs> Something interesting about Fred is that he was a really big eater. Um, on the day of his disappearance he apparently went to McDonald's so they asked his girlfriend Rhonda Rushton what his typical order would be and this is what she said. Two Big Macs, two cheeseburgers, one fish filet, and chips, which I believe is fries. Um, but I'm not sure because it's Australia, not England. Do you guys call fries chips? One thing his friend Greg said about him was that he was the type of person who would call the police if he knew that anyone had drugs or was doing drugs, which is kind of funny. Um, he was like a, he was like a boy next door type of guy. He wouldn't do drugs, you know, drugs are bad. And Fred was actually afraid of water and not a strong swimmer, so whenever he had a flight over the ocean, because, you know, he lived in Australia, he would fly wearing his life jacket already, which I just think is kind of interesting that a pilot would be so afraid of water that they are always wearing their life jacket, but, you know, he was safe. He was prepared and this kid like did not give up as we're going to talk about and I think that's the thing I like best about Fred or Frederick is that like he really just tried to do everything he could to make what he wanted happen which you know we should all learn from Fred about that. So like he didn't really do drugs Fred was also said to only drink two alcoholic beverages at a time. Um, he would never drink before flying and he wouldn't drink the day before flying either. So that's, you know, how you want your pilot to be, honestly. <laughs> you don't want a drunk pilot. Fred was raised Catholic, but he didn't really go to church that often, except for on holidays and special occasions. And he was chosen to be a flight instructor in the near future, which was something I'm sure that he was really looking forward to. Something to keep in mind for some of the theories about what happened to him. And then I just kind of wanted to talk about Melbourne at the time, because um, this was 1978. It's been a little bit since then, so let's kind of set ourselves in the time zone. So in, in Australia, there had only been color TV for three years, and also the current population was 14 million, which for the entire like continent of Australia, that is not very many people. It was also a newly conservative government in Australia at the time, but something to note is that UFOs were like in the cultural zeitgeist, they were a phenomenon at the time, everyone was talking about UFOs. I think Star Wars had just come out recently, also Close Encounters of the Third Kind, UFOs were a huge part of like what people were talking about and interested in the time so it wasn't like weird to think about the possibility of UFOs or aliens. Fred and Rhonda had been dating for a few months and earlier in that October, this happened in late October, this incident happened on October 21st but earlier in October Fred had given, actually given Rhonda a friendship ring, which I looked up is like a pre-engagement ring or a promise ring. She had actually considered this a little strange because their five month anniversary would have been October 20th um, and he gave it to her before that. So the last time Rhonda and Fred hung out was actually on October 20th, not October 21st. But interesting, interestingly, Rhonda didn't really mention that it was their anniversary. Um, in regards to them hanging out that night. She said that Fred had even almost forgotten that they were supposed to go out that night and the next night on Saturday when he was ha had this plan to fly his solo trip to King Island. And so basically he just like couldn't go on the date that Rhonda was expecting. So they pushed the time back to I think 7.30 but still this was a time that Fred never could have actually made which is c something to keep in mind. They made the plans to meet after and she had told Fred to bring a pair of extra clothes so that she he could just go straight to her 
for their date after he got back from the flight and um, those clothes were not found in his car after he disappeared. Rhonda also claimed that when Fred was really nervous he would sweat profusely and she said that on October 20th he was sweating but he didn't really say anything that was bothering him. Maybe I think it had something to do with the fact that it was their month anniversary and they weren't really doing anything. Maybe he was nervous about getting his commercial pilot license. He had another test to take in November and he had already failed a few times so this was it's very, this was very important to him becoming a commercial pilot, so I'm sure he was very focused on that. And Rhonda described Fred as not having very many people to share his problems with, and so what he would do is he would hold them in his mind, and that he held them as a list, and when he had worked out a situation, he would mentally cross it off. Also, when people talk about the Frederick Valentich situation, they like to say that he was UFO obsessed, but I really don't see that as the case. So like I said before, UFOs were like a big part of the cultural zeitgeist at the time. Excuse me, my camera died. I had to go get a new battery. I'm like really understanding how much work goes into YouTube videos. Sheesh, it's way more than I thought. Yesterday I recorded a whole video and then I realized I didn't have my microphone. So I'm doing it again with my microphone. Anyways, where was I? And a book called Chariot of the Gods had just came out and Fred was interested in it. He like had seen that movie and read the book, but he wasn't obsessed. And that was repeated by multiple family members and friends. He had like a average level of interest in UFOs. Although these interests were reignited when he was working with the Royal Australian Air Force, he was actually allowed to see classified UFO documents and this kind of like intrigued him and scared him and he even said to his dad that he was worried about attacks from UFOs and his dad told him that that was not something that would happen and not to worry about it. He also believes that he saw a UFO once his mom actually saw it first and then called him out to see it. The direct quote from the report says his mother saw a UFO one night. She called Fred and he saw it too. It was a large light, 10 times larger than a star, was stationary for a while, and then moved off at a great speed. This happened about eight months ago. And then the last little tidbit about UFOs in Fred's life was that on October 15th, which was pretty close to when this happened, Fred had said to Rondo, if a UFO landed in front of me right now, I would go in it, but never without you. How sweet. <laughs> but Rhonda said it was a passing comment and he didn't bring up UFOs or aliens again for the rest of the night. So she didn't consider him alien obsessed. So I don't really think the public should either if the people in his life didn't. Uh, I think that's cute and funny. I would love it if somebody said that to me. <laughs> Fred was an air training cadet as a boy. When he did not make it into the Royal Australian Air Force because he had very low scores and they actually labeled him as only fit for unskilled work. Rude. He actually came back as a free civilian worker, unpaid, because he wanted to be a part of it and eventually he was given the rank of airman. So that's how he probably was able to see those comfortable confidential files and you know another reason why he was just a really determined person yeah he didn't get in but he came back and he worked for them for free until he got what he wanted something we can look back at now with like a modern lens that it's very likely that Fred had ADHD or ADD or even maybe dyslexia um, because he was said to be a bad speller and he was a bad test taker his mentor, Robert Barnes, described him as impatient but smart enough to pass the test. So I think that says a lot about like, you know, how times have changed and I don't think that his testing and school scores have as much to do with his intelligence as a lot of people try to like weigh it with. Fred's pilot logbook was lost and that's what like says how many hours he has been in the air as a pilot. And so we don't know the exact amount of hours, but we know that he had at least 150. So that's what the number that people mostly use. Now you needed 147 miles to have the certification level that he had in order to fly at night in clear weather, which is called a class four instrumental rating. He had the ranking where he could fly in a clear night, but he couldn't fly if there was bad weather at night. 
But like I said, it was known that he had flown at least 150 hours, but on some paperwork that I saw, he, I think that came from, yeah, that came from October 7th, he had 160 flight hours. So he maybe had a little bit more than 150 hours, but like the safe number to say is 150 hours. So like I said, he went out of his way to meet up with Robert Barnes to get the one-on-one um, -on -one lessons and he went back to the Air Force to get this um, ranking as airman eventually because he went back as an unpaid f civilian. He was very, very determined. Another thing I just want to say to prove that point is some of the amounts of times he took tests until he passed them. So there are tests that he did pass. He had another test to take. I think it would have been his fourth attempt to take the commercial pilot license test in November and remember this incident happened in October I fully believe that he intended to take that test but let me just let you know some of these tests that he did actually pass he passed basic aeronautical knowledge on his third attempt he passed his restricted private pilot on his second attempt he did something called a PPL theory exam I don't exactly know what that is but there was a section called nav navigation and he passed that on his second attempt and then there was a section called met and he actually he passed met on his first attempt then there was aircraft performance and operation which he passed on his fifth attempt but he kept trying he just did not give up and i like i appreciate that about fred we got to give fred his flowers he did not give up he was a determined dude finally he passed air legislation on his third attempt so go fred he just really didn't give up i like that about him but he did kind of lie sometimes, which we all lie. He was a human, okay? Just because someone dies doesn't make them perfect. And, you know, Fred lied a few times. Not great, but I think we can forgive him over 30 years later. <laughs> so he had told multiple people that he actually passed that CPL commercial pilot license exam and he hadn't a l and a lot of people actually only found that out after his disappearance and this included Robert Barnes who was his mentor and that kind of made him question his trust of Fred but I don't think it was I think it was more he was embarrassed and he was determined to pass it so he thought oh it doesn't matter if I lie I'm gonna pass it eventually don't think like that <laughs> and then he had actually originally lied to Rhonda about passing some tests but a few months into their relationship he told her the truth like I said before he had made that plan for a date with Rhonda where she asked him to leave her a uh, change of clothes in the car he had also told his dad that he would be home at 11 10 or 11 p.m. which aligns better with his flight plan so it would make sense that if he was telling his dad that he would his plan was to fly to King Island, come back, and then go straight home. But he also led Rhonda to believe that they were going on a date. Which the time he said, 7.30 p.m., wasn't possible because I think he was supposed to land in King Island around that time. So he wouldn't be only halfway done with his flight. And his friend Gregory had said that typically if he was going to miss plans or be late, he would call ahead of time. The actual day of the incident, what happened? Fred woke up at home and then he went to his job as a shop assistant where he got finished around noon. From there he went to a meteorology class and after this it's assumed that he went to McDonald's for that like rather large meal I mentioned earlier. And then he headed off to the Melbourne Moorabbin Airport where he brought four life jackets with him and he actually told the staff there at Moorabbin that he was going to pick up passengers. But here's another little lie. He had told his girlfriend and other people that he was going to pick up crayfish, which are similar to lobster. I guess they're like the Australian version of lobster. Fancy, delicious, going to King Island to get some lobster. But wait, you're not allowed to fly with lobster back on a plane. So it's very possible that he just was like making up the story about the passengers to the people that work there because he knew he was going to get a crayfish and oh no no you're not allowed to bring a crayfish on the plane so he was being a little bit of a bad boy hmm frederick hmm. fred's flight plan was a 125 nautical mile trip from the melbourne moorabbin airport to king island but he would stop about halfway and turn at cape otway 
The weather was extremely clear that night, which means he had the clearance to fly. And he flew a Cessna 182L, which is a four-seater plane, and it has the ability to attach two car seats for children. It's not a seaplane, meaning it's not meant to land in the water, and it only has one engine. The particular Cessna that Fred was renting that night had just had its 100-hour inspection the day before his flight. What actually happened? What was this incident? Let's get in. Let's dig in deep here. Now, the... The actual incident is actually pretty short, what actually happened, but um, I'm going to like tell you a step-by-step -step guide of what happened, and then I'm actually going to just read the report of the, what they said to each other, because there are recordings of it, but they're like with heavy Australian accents, which sometimes are a little harder to understand, so I noticed people just like repeat it afterwards. So I'm just going to go ahead and read it, you know, like and subscribe if you like it. <laughs> At 6.10 p.m., Fred is sitting on the plane while his gas is getting topped off. He gets enough gas to go 300 miles, which is a lot farther than his trip. At 6.19 p.m., he takes off. Once he's in the air, Fred makes contact with the Melbourne Flight Service Unit, which I will probably be refer referring to as FSU. At 7 o'clock p.m., he radios in and says that he's made it to his turning point of Cape Otway. It's only six minutes later at 7.06 p.m. when he calls in and asks if there are any other aircraft in the area. Something that he first identifies as an aircraft is orbiting around him and he even says it seems like it's toying with him. He says that it's long, shiny, and metallic and he sees something that he at first mistakes as landing lights. Over the next six minutes, he's in contact with the FSU. He repeats that the aircraft is really messing with him, but he seems very matter-of-fact and calm, like he's not overreacting or freaking out to the situation as a pilot should. At 7.12 p.m., he begins to have engine problems, um, describing it as a coughing noise. Then there's a strange metallic noise, like a, like a clinging clicking sound and the transmission cuts off. Rest in peace, Fred. So, like I said, the original tape is um, not out there. It's never been found. Apparently, they gave a copy of it to his dad, Guido. But as far as the public is concerned, um, we don't have the actual tape. So, I'm going to just, like I said, read the transcript. So, when I'm over here, like this, I'm Fred. When I'm over here, I'm Steve Roby, the FSU guy. So, Steve, Fred, and then I guess the little in-between parts I'll be in the middle. <laughs> Here goes nothing. Melbourne, this is Delta Sierra Julia. Is there any no traffic below 5,000? Delta Sierra Julia, no known traffic. I am to be a large aircraft below 5,000. Delta Sierra Julia, what type of aircraft is it? Delta Sierra Julia, I cannot affirm. It is four bright, it seems to me like landing lights. Delta Sierra Juliet. Melbourne, this is Delta Sierra Juliet. The aircraft has just passed over me at at least a thousand feet above. Delta Sierra Juliet, Roger. And is it a large aircraft? Confirm. Delta Sierra Juliet, er, unknown. Due to the speed it's traveling, is there any Air Force aircraft in the vicinity? Delta Sierra Juliet, no known aircraft in the vicinity. Melbourne, it's approaching now from due east towards me. Delta Sierra Julia, open microphone for two seconds. Delta Sierra Julia, it seems to me that he's playing some sort of game. He's flying over me two, three times at a time at speeds I could not identify. Delta Sierra Julia, Roger, what is your actual level? My level is four and a half thousand. Four, five, zero, zero. Delta Sierra Julia, and confirm, you cannot identify the aircraft. Affirmative. Delta Sierra Julia, Roger, stand by. Melbourne, Delta Sierra Juliet. It's not an aircraft, it is. Open microphone for two seconds. Delta Sierra Juliet, Melbourne, can you describe the er, aircraft? Delta Sierra Juliet, as it's flying past, it's a long shape. Open microphone for three seconds. Cannot identify more than that. It has such speed. Open microphone for three seconds. Before me, right now, Melbourne, Delta Sierra Juliet, Roger, and how large would the er, object be? Delta Sierra Juliet, it seems like it's stationary. What I'm doing right now is orbiting, and the thing is just orbiting on top of me. Also, it's got a green light and a sort of metallic, like, it's all shiny on the outside. Delta Sierra Juliet. Delta Sierra Juliet. Open microphone for five seconds. It just vanished. Delta Sierra Juliet. 
Melbourne, would you know what kind of aircraft I've got? Is it a military aircraft? Delta Sierra Juliet, confirm or the aircraft just vanished. Say again, Delta Sierra Juliet, is the aircraft still with you? Delta Sierra Juliet, it's a north. Open microphone for two seconds. Now approaching from the southwest. Delta Sierra Juliet. Delta Sierra Juliet. The engine is rough idling. I've got it set at 23, 24, and the thing is coughing. Delta Sierra Juliet, Roger, what are we, what are your intentions? My intentions are uh, to go to King Island, uh, Melbourne. That strange aircraft is hovering on top of me again. Two seconds of open microphone. It's hovering and it's not an aircraft. Delta Sierra Juliet. Delta Sierra Juliet. 17 seconds of open microphone. Delta Sierra Juliet, Melbourne. There is no farther record of any transmissions from the aircraft. The alert phase of search and rescue was declared at 1912 hours. At 1933 hours, when the aircraft did not arrive at King Island, the distress phase was declared and search action was commenced. An intensive air, sea, and land search was continued until October 25th, 1978, but no trace of the aircraft was found. So no trace of the aircraft or Fred's body was ever found. The media, the media was taken by this story internationally. So Fred's name was all over the place. And this has actually been cited as some of the best evidence in UFO history. Something strange to note is that the original tape of Fred with Steve Broby has never been heard in the public. Um, there's rumors that it was given to Fred's dad, Guido, and like this one scientist named Robert Haynes, he's a UFOologist. He claims that he has the tape and I like heard his version, but he put his voice in instead of Steve Roby because apparently that part wasn't in there. And I just don't know if I believe that it's the real thing. So I'm leaving that out. And then also a lot of people say that they have the last like 17 seconds of that weird metallic noise, but I also can't confirm that that's real since like we don't have the tape. So personally, I chose not to include that in my video because I don't know if it's actual evidence and there's so much other like really great solid evidence other than that surrounding this case. So before I get to the theories, I really just want to say a quick trigger warning. Um, there are mentions of suicide and that is one of the theories. So if that makes you uncomfortable, skip ahead a little bit or, you know, come back next time. I totally understand, but I am going to get into that theory now. So Fred's family and friends like denied that suicide was a possibility and as we know uh, high functioning depression can be well hidden and it's possible that they just didn't know but I think it's pretty likely that Fred did not commit because this guy was determined like the biggest reason he would have to want to do that is that he kept failing the commercial pilot license test and he was lying about it. But the thing is, he took these t other tests time and time and time again until he passed. Like, he took one of those other tests five times. So who's to say he wouldn't have taken his CPL over and over and over again until he passed? I think that's that was Fred's plan. And I think I said before, he just knew he was going to eventually pass. So he didn't think it was that bad. He was lying that he already did. Not a great plan, but I don't think it's, like, evidence enough that he would commit personally. Skeptics also say that Fred not having a real reason to go to King Island is evidence that he was possibly planning this trip solely for the purpose of committing. But personally, I don't believe that this is true. I mean, he was trying to like sneak crayfish overseas, possibly, I think, over the ocean flying in Australia with a crayfish, not supposed to do that. And I think he was just lying to the aircraft officials, airport officials, because he didn't want to get caught bringing in a, crayf a crayfish. And then, so here's the thing about the crayfish. It's like, okay, so he didn't actually order crayfish and they happened to be sold out of crayfish that day. But Fred's personality was definitely like, oh, I'll just figure it out when I get there. He it wasn't really the type to order one ahead anyways. But his um at the air force one of the squadron leaders squadron leader grandy had told him if he flies to king island to bring him back a crayfish so he probably wanted to like you know butter up this professor a little bit or not professor squadron leader and bring him a crayfish so his plan was go to king island find a crayfish bring it back to his professor be like hey 
I brought you a crayfish. How about an A? I don't know. But, you know, I do think that maybe he was trying to butter up the professor with a crayfish and so he was willing to take a little risk to get it. And so he lied because there was no passengers that he was supposed to pick up. It's pretty obvious that wasn't true. But it's less obvious that the crayfish thing was like a total lie. I think that is honestly probably the real story. He just didn't plan well for it and he would have gotten there and been like, oh man, there's no crayfish left. Guess I gotta fly here again. And that's the other thing. He was a student pilot. So I do think that he really just wanted to fly. He, he loved flying. It was like his passion. So I think this was just another excuse to get up in the air and kind of at sunset at night, he probably thought it would be pretty and cool. And, you know, unfortunately this happened. Another kind of piece of support for this theory is that he didn't call King Island ahead of time and ask them to turn on the landing lights. So this is one of his first night flights, but the thing is, it was night. So sunset was supposed to happen at 8.50 p.m. and last light was at 9.21. He would have landed at 7... He was last heard from at 7.12 and he was supposed to land at like 7.33. So... It wouldn't have really been dark, but he did know that King Island was closed, so if he needed the landing lights turned on, he wouldn't be able to get them turned on right away when he got there if he didn't call ahead and do it. This could be a beginner's mistake. He could have thought he had enough light. I don't know, but personally, I think it's more likely a mistake than evidence that he wasn't ever planning on landing. Rhonda considered Fred a very good pilot, you know, that was his, that was her man. She said he was a good pilot and, but she did kind of say that he had strange habits. So these concerned the use of the radio, you know, the, that means the microphone that he's talking to the FSU on, which is where we got this conversation from. And she said that she was aware that he usually clicked the microphone button after transmitting and that he never put it back on the rack and he would usually set it in his lap. And sometimes when he did this, he would put it in his lap, it would activate the microphone. He also apparently had the habit of polishing the microphone on his finger like that, sorry, or I guess on his sleeve like that. So those are what those would sound like, I guess. He would do that before he used the microphone sometimes, I guess, out of habit. She also said that he had long legs and that he would scoot the seat back like partway through the flight when he got uncomfortable and maybe this could account for the metallic noise that she had heard talked about in the newspapers. And one thing that the investigators did mention was that Rhonda seemed to enjoy the attention of the frenzy of the news around the situation, but that she also they said she did not appear to be unduly concerned and gave the impression that she expected to see him again. She claimed that there was a permanency to her relationship with Frederick and that they had plans to become engaged. She seemed to think that she would see him again, which is sweet, and, you know, maybe she was, like, swept up in the craziness of the news and she thought it was fun, but... Yeah. Apparently, Guido... Fred's dad kind of dismissed the relationship as of no consequence, but at that age, maybe you don't tell your dad so much. Who knows how seriously Fred really took Rhonda? We don't know. And then also during the search and rescue, they actually spotted some wreckage, possibly, but they had to fly a little higher to get a clear view of it, and then they lost it. So that was seen as something that they could have possibly missed. Another theory is that this is was just a hoax gone wrong. People think that because Frederick was like a fan of aliens, I guess the books and the movies that he liked and kind of brought up UFO sometimes, that that meant that maybe he was faking all of this in order to be like remembered and make a big scene and maybe he had a plan to come back and have this whole big alien abduction story but it went wrong like I don't know what they're thinking but I just need to say for all of the members of the alien abduction support group just because you like aliens doesn't mean that it's a hoax okay I would never do a hoax look at all my alien stuff if I am abducted it's real I'm not hoaxing you people I promise 
Please don't think that I hoaxed it just because I like aliens. I would not do that. I would really be abducted, okay? So, like, know that. Just know it's not a hoax. I was really abducted, but hopefully it never happens. Anyways. Fred. So, even his girlfriend said that he only had an average interest in UFOs. So, to me, that seems like pretty good evidence that he wasn't crazy obsessed. And he did say that he had seen that UFO and he had heard that like classified information from the Australian government about aliens. So, and he was, he didn't tell, he told his family that he had read stuff, but he didn't tell them what he read. Though he did keep his commitment to the Australian government by not leaking alien government secrets. But he did tell them that he knew them, which is, you know, I would be pressing for answers. But like I said, most of the witnesses actually said that they never had heard Fred mention UFOs. Um, the only people that really did were Rhonda and his parents. So it was kind of like a private little interest. I don't think it was anything he was crazy obsessed with. But yeah, people believe that he either, like, it was a hoax or that he planned to land somewhere. He wanted some sort of fame from it. But... I find this unlikely because of his fear of water and he didn't have a seaplane so he couldn't have landed in the water and where he would have had to land in Cape Otway he would have been found. He also could not have been that far out of the circle that we know about because like I said the um, King Island airport was closed like their radios go a certain range so like he could talk to Melbourne for a certain distance and he was talking to Melbourne when this happened which means he was in a certain ring of an area and Cape Otway falls in that ring but not a like it's pretty big but he would have had to been somewhere completely wrong in order to have gotten away with this and I feel like they would have seen him on radar or something I don't know to me, this doesn't seem very likely. He also wasn't a strong swimmer. He was a newer pilot. Why would he like purposefully land in the middle of nowhere just to do an alien hoax when he's like really committed to becoming a pilot? A lot of skeptics think that the, this was actually a case of disorientation because it was one of Fred's first times flying at night. But as we established, it wasn't night yet it was sunset and not even really quite sunset I don't know but people still bring this up as um, a factor he could have been disoriented sorry I'm worried I'm gonna go over my time because I filmed a little over last time being a youtuber is hard guys it's hard but I like it I'm, I'm doing my best I hope you enjoy it I hope you like my video I hope I sound good I hope my lighting's fine um, my mom said she's gonna judge me on it so Jennifer I hope you're pleased I'm going to read this theory because it's kind of, okay. One theory suggests that he was spiraling downward, much like the way JFK Jr. passed away in what is called a graveyard dive. And Fred was disoriented by a tilted horizon, which happens when your visual information and the information on your instruments do not agree. So, like when you're looking around outside, it doesn't make sense to what the machine is telling you is happening. But as a pilot, you have to know the machine is right. So maybe this was happening and Fred just wasn't a skilled enough pilot to trust the machines over his own mind is what they're saying and that's what caused the disorientation. This would cause Fred to fly too low and spiral and they thought that maybe he saw his own plane's reflection in the ocean and thought that was the other aircraft. But this is honestly easily debunked because he was talking to the FSU people for like six minutes and in the plane he was in, if he was like upside down and spiraling, he would have crashed in way faster than six minutes. He could not have sustained that for as long as he was having the conversation. The plane could literally not last a minute upside down. Another wild skeptic theory suggests that he like couldn't see clearly and became disoriented by the horizon, that tilted horizon again, and he saw Venus, Mercury, Mars, and the brightest star, which is called Antor, and these formations together made like a diamond shape and he mistaked it as an aircraft. This completely ignores Fred's description of something metallic and the green light that he said he saw so that one's too out there for me 
Somebody else said something about, like, if a little bit of oil leaked out of the engine and then got on the window, then, like, you know how when there's, like, a reflection on gas, like, it makes that weird rainbow? Like, maybe that happened and that disoriented him like crazy while he was flying. But, like, I just, it's a stretch. It's, it's a stretch. A little too stretchy. Next. Then we have more skeptics. Okay, we're getting to the fun theory soon, but... We got to give these skeptics their moment. Here's your moment. Aurora Australis. This is Aust this is Aurora Australis's moment, okay? This is Aurora Australis's moment. And she's beautiful, honestly. She's really beautiful. A man named John Mill claimed to see some Aurora Australis. And this is like the Northern Lights look, but I guess it's the Southern Lights. I don't know. Don't quote me on that. But I'll pull up some pictures around here somewhere. Yeah, okay, it's in the southwestern si skies. I had that in my notes. But it's an as atmospherical, atmospheric display of light. This dude, John Mills, thought that maybe that's what Fred saw, but honestly, still ignores the shiny metallic thing. I feel like you can tell the difference between, like, natural phenomenon and a plane flying and orbiting around you and messing with you. I don't know. Seems a little crazy to get those two things mixed up to me, but I'm just an alien abduction support group leader, so what do I know? So Fred was flying over the Bass Strait, and because the weather conditions were so good that day, the wreckage should have been found because of the conditions, but unfortunately they weren't. One oil slick was found and examined, but I guess the sample wasn't that great, but they still determined that it most likely wasn't from the airplane because of the oil was organic and not the type of oil that would be used in the Cessna plane that Fred was using. There was also, so five years later, this cow flap on a beach in Flinders Island. This was in 1983, I believe. It washed up and they thought it was from, it was definitely from a Cessna. Some of the like numbers of the like coded whatever the code they use to know what the plane parts are, like, some of it matched up to the Cessna, but not all the way, and they couldn't, like, say it definitely was. It was just from, like, the series of Cessnas built at that time. But the thing is, two other Cessnas reported losing that same part much closer to Flinders Island, so it's much more likely that it was from one of those planes. In order to have been from Fred's plane, it would have had to like go really far on the sea floor in like not very deep water. And while it's possible, it would have had to like slush through so much debris and other, you know, stuff that's at the bottom of the ocean, reefs and plants and other junk. It's just very unlikely that it would have gotten that far to Flinders Island. Some people say that that's evidence that it was a piece of Fred's plane. Personally, I believe that even if Fred's plane was found, that is an evidence to me that says he was not having an interaction with a UFO or aliens or something because just because you find the plane, like I would need to see much clearer evidence that that didn't happen because the stuff he said is suspicious at best. So I would need much more information than just a piece of the plane to believe that nothing happened that was out of the ordinary that day. But the Bass Strait is kind of uh, like a Bass Strait Triangle, like you know the Bermuda Triangle, but the Bass Strait Triangle. The thing is, it is very typically rough water in the Bass Strait, and it's like not the most safe area to be um, driving your boat around and whatnot. But um, like all of the ocean, like really you have to really know what you're doing to get around correctly. But here are some of the strange things that happened in the Bass Strait. In 1920, a ship went missing, and then two aircrafts went looking for it, and they also went missing. Strange lights were also reported to be seen that night. In 1942, strange lights were reported by a fisherman that looked like a doorway of light, which I guess is how some people describe portals. In 1944, a dark shadow flew by a bomber before it disappeared and I think okay don't quote me on this but um there's this what's that what's the new band that the guy from Nirvana's in the Foo Fighters the Foo Fighters is referring to like World War II planes that saw these weird dark shadows and like maybe UFOs and stuff in the sky 
I'll have to look into that in a farther video, but I this kind of comes in a little bit here in the Bass Strait. <laughs> World War II, Dark Shadows. Need to look up more about the Foo Fighters. Grew up with some of the songs, though. They're cool. Oh, I missed one. In 1934, a plane carrying 10 passengers vanished and no evidence of the plane was ever found. But an oil slick was actually found in that situation, which an oil slick is evidence of that's where a plane um, sunk in the ocean. But yeah, 17 planes were lost in the Bass Strait in World War II alone. So something to think about. The Bass Strait, the Bass Strait is already kind of like a strange area. So this Reddit user actually had an interesting theory. I can't remember their name, I'm sorry, but um, I like this theory. And I was kind of thinking something along the same lines. Um, maybe it's a military conspiracy. They said that the first generation of stealth aircraft was in the 1960s and 70s, and it would not have been detected by radar. Fred himself was concerned that it was a military plane. And an accident could have occurred with the military plane and Fred's plane and the Australian government chose to cover it up and let people think it was a UFO in order for them to not get blamed for the incident. <laughs> it's a pretty good theory. Also, because this is the alien abduction support group, we must say that some people also believe that governments have UFO technology and have used it in the past to fake abductions. So that is... It's a theory that I like. I like that theory. Good theory, Reddit user. Please like and subscribe if you watch this video <laughs> and tell me who you are. I will give you credit. Another little fun thing is that Fred never called it a UFO, but immediately everyone else did. It's even in the report mentioned as a UFO multiple times, and Fred never called it that. He never said, it's UFO, oh, it's aliens. If he was doing a hoax, don't you think he would have done that? Don't you think he would have been like, the aliens are here. Oh my gosh, they're attacking me. Aliens, 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 UFO, UFO, UFO. But no, he, he did not say any of that. The most he said was, it's hovering and it's not an aircraft. And he described the lights and like he was, I feel like if you were hoaxing, you would be way more straight up, you know? So the first time that the report from the trans the Department of Transportation um, mentions UFO, they say this. They say the aircraft then made a farther report that that UFO was still in the vicinity. Considering Fred himself did not call it a UFO, it's pretty telling of what the Australian authorities thought that was happening. I think the Australian authorities themselves believed that this was a UFO. So. I thought that was an interesting little... <laughs> like I said, I read this over 300-page report from the Department of Transportation in Australia. And I'm going to put it up on the screen. I'm going to read this to you. This is what they said was the likely cause of Fred's disappearance. In the absence of any farther concrete evidence, one can only suggest a number of hypothe hypotheses to explain this disappearance. A. UFO intervention. No farther comment apart from the observation that there were no sighting reports of a brightly illuminated craft large enough to take on board a Cessna 182. The report says the most likely way that Fred disappeared was from a UFO. That's what the report, the government, the Australian government's report says that it was a UFO. So like, whoa. <laughs> I think that's pretty, that's, the, the Australian government thinks it's a UFO, guys. Anyways, the other less exciting things that they thought, B, disorientation. This was one of the theories that I discussed earlier. At the place and time of the occurrence, this is a distinct possibility and even probability. On the other hand, it would have resulted in uncontrolled impact with the sea, and one would have expected wreckage to result. No wreckage. Didn't find any wreckage. C, Controlled landing on the sea with the intention of escaping from the aircraft before it sank. This could have been successful or not successful. In either case, no wreckage would be found, and in the latter event, the body could still be in the aircraft. D. 
Successful landing elsewhere. Perhaps Valentich was not where he said he was and he landed in a remote location. And E. Crash elsewhere when attempting D and the wreckage has not yet been discovered. I think that's pretty interesting that the actual report says that the most likely thing that happened was a UFO attack. So now we're on to the fun evidence. The stuff that like points more towards actually it was a UFO. Um... One thing that was on the original episode of Unsolved Mysteries, because this case was, you know, um, first kind of like really showcased on Unsolved Mysteries, but they, it's pretty short, so I wanted to go a little bit deeper into the dive, but there was this um, photographer named Roy Manifold, and he took a series of pictures of the sunset on October 21st, 1978. And he captured this strange picture in the series, and, like, the rest of them don't have it, where it's this, like, weird black little bob blob in the corner. I'll put the picture up. It was actually sent to labs and tested. Like, he was a photographer. He printed his photos all the time. He said he never had made a mistake like this. And, and so they actually had it sent to labs, and it was said that this is a part of the picture. It's not a mistake from the chemicals he was using or whatever. It, this was a part of the picture. And so it kind of looks like it could be a metallic thing with exhaust around it, but it is kind of a stretch. But it did happen on the same night around the same time. So is it evidence? What do you think? Let me know in the comments. So here's some more fun evidence. Five days later, Steve Roby, the guy from the FSU that was talking to Fred, he worked for the aircraft, air traffic control and he was back at work and another pilot radioed in. They were above an area called East Sail and he said he was being followed by an intensely bright light that seemed like it was toying with him. And it was toying with him that it, so much so that it forced him to prematurely land the aircraft, like, somewhere not an airport. And over 50 reports of UFOs were logged in the surrounding days of Fred's in incident um, in the area that his disappearance happened. These included... A senior Constable Campbell of Forrest had a report from some children of an aircraft towing a glider in the Burwan Downs, Apollo Bay area at about 5 30 to 6 o'clock p.m. on Saturday, October 21st. The report was made because it was unusual for a glider to be in that part of the state and there were actually no gliders in the area um, that was like looked up and so what they were seeing is more likely a UFO than a glider in this situation. A John Snow rang re-UFO October 23rd, 1978. He was driving his car on a Saturday night, October 21st, 1978, at about 11.45 in the Barwin Heads area when his 11-year-old son saw a greenish white of some length flash quite fast across the sky to the south. It was not observed by any other member of the family in the car as it, is apparently, as it apparently had moved fast. And at approximately 1,800 hours on October 22nd, 1978, um, a phone call was received by one of the investigators. Mr. Parr stated that he was a responsible person, an officer of the Royal Australian Air Force Reserve, and he did not wish to create the opinion that he was a nut, which is funny. But he said, at about 1855 hours on Saturday, October 21st, 1978, he was traveling from Mount Waverley in a southerly direction Along Huntington Road, he observed a shower of very bright metallic scintillations to the south, high in the sky, at an angle of about 45 degrees from the horizontal, 1.5 degree of the area in vertical plane, and 1, 1 degree of are in the internal plane, about 30 bright entries, followed by a dark contrail moving from south to north. At first, he thought it to be a meteor shower. Then I found this, like, I'm going to show it up on the screen. There are actual reports that they had in the Australian government in the 1970s at the time where you could fill out UFO reports. Like, if you thought you saw a UFO, they had a specific report for you to fill out. So this is what one guy wrote on one. There's, like, a part where you just you do a narrative description of what happened. So he said, I was driving along the Great 
Declan Road between Y River, A. Lorne, W. E. Left Y River about blah, blah, blah. Okay, so this dude was driving after about 7, 10 p.m. in this specific area that you can read on the thing, but his handwriting is not great. So you let me know where you think he was in the comments. My wife brought to my attention a light out to sea, which was described as a flare because it seemed to rise and then dip towards the sea. But later, it then rose again because of the nature of the road I was unable to look for 30 SAS to one, oh, 30 seconds to one minute. At that time, the light seemed to be steady in the sky. And I said I thought it was an airplane, and we stopped watching. At the time, this explanation did not completely satisfy us, but we said, what else could it be? Just kind of crazy that they had a UFO report specifically for you to fill out. Now we got a bit of a doozy here. This is a report of a UFO sighting by my wife and self at 7.40 p.m. on the night of, the, of Saturday the 21st of October 1978 at Valley View, South Australia, on the above mentioned evening, I stepped outside to call out our cat when my wife was concerned as it had shunned her due to the fact that we had strange kittens in the house. After no response from the cat, I pondered and gazed in the sky. When I saw what I took to be a large plane approaching from the from an SSE direction, the plane appeared to be quite near when, with what I took to be its landing lights on and colored lights at both sides. I thought this an unusual direction for such an approaching heavy plane as if it continued it meant that it would have to cross the flight path of the major airliners heading for the Adelaide airport. My curiosity arose. I decided to wait and view this plane which I estimated would be directly overhead in approximately three minutes. To my amazement this did not occur as it came no closer after having waited a period of some seven minutes or more. My wife came to see what I was doing outside so long and said to me, what on earth are you looking at in the sky? To which I replied, well, look at that end. Tell me what you think it is. Her reply was, it's not a star for it is too big. I then asked, well, what do you think it could be? To which she replied, it's a rocket. As you can see, the colored lights coming from it. I then said to her, if that's the case, how could it stay in the sky so long? For I have been watching it for between seven to ten minutes then she then said no you're right it can't be and the two of us stood gazing in amazement at the large white yet yellow light and by now an assortment of colors flashing at the two sides having got my binoculars from within the house i focused this focused this object but i found my hands unsteady so i rested them on a small statue on the patio when i was able to finally Focus absolutely clear onto the unexplainable object, what I saw was a large triangular yellow-white light laying on its side with one side of the triangle in a virtual position. Within the triangle flashing from point A, B, C, and D were iridescent lights. I can only positively remember three of the colors, which were blue, blue-green, and orange, but feel sure that there were also others. My wife watched it for nearly enough for nearly enough 10 minutes and myself for a total of roughly 45 minutes before losing sight of it behind a large gum tree two gardens away. During the last stages of viewing this assortment of colors it transferred into a v-shape still on its side with the top half coming to be the reflection of the lower portion as one might view a boat sitting in the surface of the water. I reported this matter to the Edinburgh airport at 5.45 p.m. Monday on the 23rd of October and was told by a girl that this information would be passed on to the UFO inv investigation officer in the morning. By now, I was aware that I had seen word for word exactly as the missing Melbourne pilot had described. I rang again Edinburgh airport the following day, October 24th, and spoke to an officer who told me he would try either to come see me at my place of work or at my home in the evening. As by the following day, October 25th, he had not made the effort to interview me. I again phoned and told him my concern, pleading for him to heed this information, which I felt so vitally in the case of the missing pilot. After confirming my statement with my wife over the phone, this officer subsequently visited my home and took a signed statement from me along with a diagram of the three stages that this 
moving light had taken. I have no doubt in my mind that whatsoever I witnessed was exactly as the young pilot described who has gone missing and was said to be flying upside down at the time of the 21st of October. I am prepared to swear on the oath or submit myself to a lie detector test to sus- to sustain this statement. Sheesh, that was a lot of reading. Two months later in New Zealand, there was an incident called the Christchurch Incident. So on December 20th, 1978, Augustine's freight planes claimed that strange lights were following them and it was actually confirmed on radar. Various numbers of them followed for about 20 miles at a distance of about one kilometer. On December 30th, a reporter named Quentin Fogarty uh, joined a flight with them. And the lights actually happen again. And again, they're confirmed on radar. And they're described as very large lights with some orange on the top of some of them. So they decide to go back so that the reporter can get a better camera. So he does, he goes back and he gets the camera and they go back, but this time it's not as friendly. It's actually, it's actually pretty frightening. This time they're followed for longer and more aggressively. The UFOs were flying so low that they could see their reflection in the water. And this was all caught on radar. Then that guy I was talking about earlier, Richard Haynes, who like claims to have the tape with Fred's actual voice on it. Well, he thought that Fred's story lined up with these other strange plane disappearances so, according to Richard Haynes, um, here's the list that he kind of saw as a pattern of UFO incidents with pilots. In 1970, U.S. pilot William Schaffner, who was um, based in the U.K., he never returned um, after going to check out a UFO incident, and they actually found his plane but his body was not inside of it, and the canopy canopy was completely closed like he should have been inside the plane. In 1973, he listed a case called the Coin Case. This is when a helicopter was apparently pulled up 2,000 feet by a tractor beam from a UFO. Crazy. Now, this is all, like, allegedly what Rich, Richard Haynes is saying, just so you know. In 1975, Carlos de los Santos said that a UFO was harassing him while he was on a flight. He also said that his aircraft was pulled up by a tractor beam. In 1976, a Turan UFO actually stopped a bunch of fighter jets from firing missiles. They all jammed, apparently. In 1977, there was something called the Castillo de Bodi case in Portugal, which was when a plane was nearly hit by a UFO and caused it to do a nosedive off of the Dornier. So those are Richard's, like, list that he had of similar incidents that he considered Frederick Valentich's incident to be and disappearance to be, like, a part of. But then also, like, in research, I found that in 1980, there was these other pilots that were in Puerto Rico on June 28th in 1980. Jose Pagan Santos was in the Mona Channel of the Caribbean Ocean with Jose Antonio Maldonado Torres. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And they took off at 1810 and they were in an air coup. Air coup? They were in an air coup, which was owned by Jose Pagan Santos's father, whose name was Jose Pagan Jimenez. His dad was actually an aero police officer um, in Puerto Rico, which is interesting. But at 2003, Las Mesas radar site and several aircraft picked up transmission from Jose's plane that they said that they saw a strange object and it messed with them before they were cut off and disappeared with no trace to ever be found. So I'm going to actually play that recording because that recording is available to hear. So here's that recording now.
and no trace of their aircraft was ever found either. Another little Easter egg, I guess you could say, I found in the report was that somebody suggested in the report they actually wrote that they should share their findings with the Ministry of Defense, actually. And they stated that it is relevant that investigation of reports of unidentified flying objects rests with your colleagues, the Minister for Defense. You may care to give them a copy of this message. Appropriate officers at the working level of the Royal Australian Air Force have already been informed. But like I said, even if the plane had crashed and they found it, unless like Fred was in it, even still, I don't know. It's hard to fight that this was aliens or UFO related, unless it was military. Was You know? So Fred's father, Guido, actually believes that Fred was abducted. And I think that this is more comforting to him than the other possibilities. And also he himself, he has said that he was a much bigger believer in aliens than Frederick himself. So, you know, if he wants to believe that his son is out there in space, still living, I think we can give him that. I would prefer to believe that, you know, maybe that... Maybe that's what he did in his next life, even if he did pass away. You know? Who knows? Let's hope Fred's out there in space, you know, prospering for the humans out there. You never know. This is the support group. We are supportive. Unfortunately, Guido did pass away in the year 2000. I truly believe that there is, like, enough solid evidence. There's these other UFO sightings, the strange things that he said the way that they never found any wreckage from his plane or like anything else around it. I really believe that there's a lot of evidence that this could have been an alien intervention, as the report puts it. And they believed it too, the Australian government. So for me, I'm sold. I think that this was alien intervention. The Australian government thinks this was alien intervention. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. Please like and subscribe. What do you think? Do you think that it was a hoax or or an accident or disorientation? For me, I think that if it wasn't aliens, then it had to be disorientation or military. I think really, honestly, I think aliens, military, disorientation, other bullshit. (laughs) so yeah let me know what you think in the comments like subscribe i made an instagram this is cloud shadow tv i'm jesse welcome to the alien abduction support group let's support each other let's learn about aliens together let's try to like figure this shit out what is going on what is going on we're learning together guys so if there's any topics that you want me to cover or cases that you find particularly interesting if there's any like nice critiques you want to give me a compliment sandwich about what you thought about this video i would love a compliment sandwich please like and subscribe i really appreciate you watching what do you think happened to fred i think he was abducted by aliens i'm with guido all right earthlings i'll see you next time thanks for watching have a great day